on, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. This is uh, PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories. The best conversations happen at happy hour. Welcome to ours. I'm Jimmy McKay. I'm your host, broadcasting live from the RES Medical Studios. It's also known as, it's pretty much my, this is my living room. I know I call it a studio, but it's really just my living room. Uh, find them online at aureusmedical.com. The leaders in hashtag travel physical therapy. What you do is essential as physical therapists and physical therapist assistants. You decide where your license and your career takes you. So find them at aureusmedical.com. Don't forget, subscribe to the show. iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. I actually just ran into somebody the other day and they were like, well, how much does it cost to subscribe to a podcast? It sounds like there's a monetary transaction. No, subscribing to a podcast just means you never miss an episode. Sometimes you need to over communicate, and I wanted to do that, that with you right now. We're also video casting these on YouTube, so you can see my face do the intro every time, and I apologize for that. YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at PT Pinecast on the socials. Uh, I think that's all I need. Oh, uh, questions and comments. If you're watching this live, drop uh, live and then your name and where you're from. I'm always I'm terribly interested about where people are watching and or listening to the show and how you're consuming it. So if you're doing that let us know live and where you are. And uh, if you're watching the replay as well, always curious people watch the replay afterwards. That's always fun. So do that uh, no matter what platform you're on, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. Or, and I put this out there, you feel free to text or call me. This is my actual phone number I just flashed on the screen. I'll put it up there again. And people think, well, it's just like, that's actually my phone number. I'm not going to say it for the podcast listeners. I, this I want for the, the viewers on, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, drop us a text and let us know in real time what you guys are thinking about the show. So that's the first round. It's brought to you by our friends at Owens Recovery Science, a single source for PTs looking for certification in personalized blood flow restriction, rehabilitation training, and the equipment you need to apply it in clinic properly. That is a mouthful, and I did it all on one breath. I don't want to brag. But let's get the serious music here. Uh, we've got a great show for you tonight. We're talking about a presentation that happened uh, this year at CSM, which feels like seven years ago. Let's be honest here. It feels like seven years ago. Um, it was about social determinants of health and the impact on PT outcomes. So we bring you virtually, of course, the people who helped present that. Let's bring them to the show. Lisa Van Hoos, Rupal Patel, Zachary Rethor. Welcome to the show. <sighs> It's the, only way, it's the only way to do it in 2020 when we're virtual. I keep this button right here, this button I'm talking about right here, handy at all times, no matter what Zoom meeting I'm on. It just gives me a feeling of like, hey, great job, Jimmy. Ah, I feel like everybody should have one of these. And it will just yes. it will raise your spirits every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the uh, to the show. Glad to, uh, to steal you for a bit of time and talk about a really important topic, which is being discussed a lot in our, our profession right now. And we like to jump on top of that and continue discussion. So first of all, thank you guys for coming out. Well, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Uh, we thank get you. hard questions out of the way first. I swear, this will be the hardest question of the whole show. What are we drinking? Lisa, we start with you. Amaretto Sour. In a copper cup. In a copper cup, so it stays chill. I thought about wine, but I had wine last night for another <laughs> meeting. I like it. I mean, this is a perfect meeting accessory. We're going to be talking about diversity, so I'm yeah. diversifying my adult beverage. <laughs> All right, Rupa, what do you got in there? You got a wine glass. I do. I have a wine glass, and it's a Chilean, one of my favorite Chilean wines, Camomere. So, and it's the same bottle I opened last night, Lisa, at the same meeting you and I were at, and I'm finishing. No, you got you. Don't don't quit. Make sure you finish. That. <laughs> what do you got? I have a Japanese whiskey here. Uh, so I've been into scotch for a while, but I'm I'm branching out and uh, seeing what international whiskey flavors are like. So this is a nice Suntory. I like it. Wow. I had never heard about like Japanese whiskeys being a thing. And I was watching on something on PT Twitter and people were like, oh, I'm expanding. I think it was probably Jerry Durham. I'm expanding my Japanese whiskey collection. I'm like, I'm just working on my regular whiskey in the kitchen collection. Uh, I need to say thank you to professor and physical therapist Jay Grimes from Sacred Heart University. Uh, he sent me a couple of these. This is the Mega Boss IPA from Newburgh Brewing. A perfect way to say thank you to your favorite podcast host would be to send him beer. So well done. 
<laughs> uh, so we've we've got the hardest question out of the way first. Let, let's just go around the horn, just set the table. We want to make sure the audience feels comfortable with the guests. Uh, Lisa, when someone asks uh, who you are, what you do, how do you how do you respond? Um, so I say that I am a mother, a wife, I'm a daughter, a sister. I am located in Monroe, Louisiana. Um, which if you're wondering, we're 40 miles north of, um, well, 40 miles south of the Arkansas border. I am the program director at the University of Louisiana Monroe, and I'm also the owner of the Ojima Institute. Perfect. All right, Rupal, same question. Same question. Okay. I'm a mother, yeah. daughter, wife, um, health promoter. I'm an Asian Indian. I'm immigrant and uh, a physical therapist and a faculty member at Texas Women's University in Houston, Texas. You know, I, I like, and usually I do the big fancy radio intro for the guests, and I'm liking this flipping the let the guests introduce who they are, right? And and like a perfect example is, you know, in, in your ID there, well, you put your pronouns. Hmm. So that's like another way. Maybe, maybe I should start to include this in how I do things, which is let the guests introduce themselves. I'll, I like that. All right, Zach. So no pressure now. You're last. <laughs> yeah. So I'm. Uh, I'll follow up. I'm a, I'm a husband. I have two wonderful kids. Uh, I am a faculty Aww. development resident during the day at Duke University. Uh, at night, I moonlight in my own telehealth practice, uh, Rethorn PT and Wellness. I'm finishing a PhD and wearing a lot of other hats as well. Uh, feeling a bit overwhelmed. I think the latest hat I've picked up is homeowner slash DIYer now doing yeah. some projects. So this weekend I'll be blowing out a wall. Uh, so learning all about load bearing structures and how things like that work. It's not ever something I've had to do before. I would like to hear how that turns out. That is the before, you know, the, the Twitter thing going around, how it started and how it turned out. I would love to see a before and after picture to see where that goes. Hopefully the after picture isn't like a caved in house for me doing. <laughs> I want to see no blood anywhere in the Rethorn house. Um, so uh, Lisa, Rupal, Zach, we bring you on because you guys did a presentation at CSM in Denver. That was actually in 2020. I don't know if you guys can wrap your head around that being the same year that we are still in fact in. Oh, I know. Last time I took a trip that, you know, for a conference that, you know, so many since then I've missed and yeah. just been doing these Zoom boxes for those and surreal. Yeah, well, we will give a nod, Lisa. You're you're giving a keynote at the New England uh, conference. Some states up there: New England, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, all coming uh, all coming together to kind of do a a conference as well. So you're going to be doing the keynote for that. Yes, that first week of November. I'm super excited. So it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have you broadcasting your keynote on this show. I don't know if you knew that, but you will. I did not know that <laughs> your your keynote will be broadcast via this channel. Oh, All so right. do I get to drink while I'm doing it? It's actually required at that show, at that conference. <laughs> Weird, but it's in, if you look real small, it's in the fine print. Uh, but let's talk about that presentation you guys gave at uh, at CSM. Uh, first off, I'd love to hear the backstory behind conference presentations, which sounds like one of the geekiest things I've ever said in my entire life. But I do love how people have this bumpability factor because you all have unique and diverse backgrounds. How did you guys kind of come together and form this like Avengers moment and say, hey, here's this thing let's do this thing together. Wow. I don't even remember guys, but I can tell you a story about, you know, how I met Zachary okay. was actually through Twitter. Correct, Zachary? If, uh, yeah. Please correct me if I don't remember. And then the next time we saw each other and, you know, we reached out to you like, hey, let's get together and meet in person. And I remember sitting at the bar and I think you were having one of those whiskeys that I you were having. And we were talking about like, you know, and you're like, we should do a presentation together. And then I think the next year we did one at Next. And um, uh, so that's, how, I remember that's how I met um, Zachary. And I think Lisa, the first time, I met you in person. We also followed each other on Twitter and we saw each other at the diversity um, uh, dinner, the minority uh, dinner at CSM. And we're like, oh my God, I know you from Twitter. And I, I just felt like we had an instant connection. And since then we've kind of just gravitated and done things together. So that's my memory. I don't know about this exact presentation. <laughs> well, if we keep drinking, the memories will change probably. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the presentation you guys uh, you guys gave together at CSM in Denver just a couple months ago. What was the title? What was the aim? What were you what were you what was the goal of of leaving the audience with? Hmm. 
You're don't asking. answer it once, separately, completely. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. Our title. My goodness. It was we were one of three um, presentations that we worked together with about 13 to 15 people in all to develop a series of presentations on better together in diversity, equity and inclusion. And so we were, I think, number two in the series where we were looking at engaging diverse populations to improve rehabilitation outcomes and focusing on uh, social determinants and how that impacts health outcomes. So okay. that was our niche, our lane in that whole series. So yeah. something that you guys were all discussing just before we went live, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, just tonight, you were talking about something that impacts, is a social determinant of health, and that was something to do with an election. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of in the middle of a big thing right now, you know, in the U.S., and um, we were talking about the fact of that, and RuPaul has voted today, and we'll let her kind of talk about her story. But I was sharing the fact of that I have not had the opportunity to vote yet here in Monroe, number one, because the lines are very long, and number two, there's such a strong police presence. And so in our community, people are talking about that and how that that is a deterrent to them wanting to vote. And so we were talking about how that that's a form of suppression. And um, Rupa, I'm going to pitch it to you to kind of give your thoughts on how you were correlating that with health and wellness. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think voting rights are a public health issue. And there's actually a hashtag on Twitter, vote for health with, I just uh, put in our chat, Jimmy, that you can put in the comments um, and at voting for health. And I think they talk about how, you know, looking upstream at kind of the structural forces um, that determine our health. And a lot of that has to do with empowering people and being able to ensure that they have the right to have their voice heard. People with disabilities, people that, um, you know, uh, uh, have low literacy, people that are of second language, that are citizens, people that um, uh, perhaps live in areas where there's not a whole lot of voting sites for them to go to. And so uh, the time to go vote and those kind of things are huge issues and they impact our societal health as well as our individual health. So, you know, that's important. And um, where I live, Fort Bend County in Texas is one of the most diverse counties in, in the nation, which is awesome. And we have a lot of polling sites. So today I just uh, went to vote with my daughter who's 18 and this is her first yeah. uh, national election. And so they gave us the, I voted, you earned it and you, you exercised your right to vote in a, in a great yeah. way. Um, yeah. In a conversation I had with uh, one of the APTA board members, Sky Donovan, she threw a stat at me and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, because that's how uh, the internet works. But it was in a recent poll, more than 3 million Americans felt that they did. They, they felt that, uh, accessing polling locations due to their lack of mobility uh, was an issue. And so you're talking about social determinants of health, like wh how many polling locations, where are they? Okay, great. I'm in the parking lot, but I can't safely get into the polling place. Or maybe if I'm in there, I can't access the polls. So there are different things. And this is where like the mind of a, of a PT and a PTA comes into it. Yes, that you got there, but now what? And how are we going to get you to that, that actual poll? So let's start with the different social determinants. Of really, the the focus, the the some of the the legs of the uh, the pillars of your talk. Let's start with diversity, equity, and inclusion. How does this come into play when we're talking about social determinants of health and an impact on PT outcomes? Zach, you take this one. <laughs> Thrown at the yes, fire. I'm, I'm, I am more than happy to to let the two of you uh, go for it here, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and you can correct me where I'm wrong. You know, I think at the end of the day, where this comes from uh, is is we have to be looking outside of the traditional biomedical model and even outside of, of, of health behaviors that we're beginning to look at more like what are folks physical activity and what are folks diet? Um, how are they sleeping? How are they managing stress? Those are all individual factors, right? So, uh, you know, those are things that, that an individual theoretically could control or change. But the reality is that all of those decisions don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a context. And that context is what shapes the paradigms that makes those decisions make sense or not, that gives individuals the ability to, to engage in those healthy behaviors or not. Um, and, and really, when you look at how a community becomes healthy, um, I think if we're not embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are not going to have uh, just and healthy communities in our society. And we see that around the world. 
um, in cultures that value diversity, equity, and inclusion beyond um, individuals, right? And, and they put that into their culture. Um, it's a part of their the way that they think about their norms of governance and policymaking, um, as well as thinking about laws and sort of codified rules. When you see that, the, the gaps between the, the people who are best off and people who are worst off are a lot less than what we have here. So huh. when you look around the world, this isn't just a cherry on top issue. This is a core issue that I think we need to be discussing in our profession, in healthcare in general, and as a society. Many I'm people- gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shut up now and I'm gonna let my <laughs> colleagues take it from here. You just did such a great job. My goodness, that was such a great, uh, awesome job. So I think, you know, we keep talking about the words because the words are important. And in the PT world, we've got to embrace this lexicon. And so diversity is the what. So it is all of those differing elements that make you who you are. And I love listening to um, Grupal talk about this because she made this point that we often talk about diversity as people, but really it is all of those elements that make up that person. And so everyone brings diversity into a room with them. It's just whether or not if we recognize it. And so diversity is the what. The inclusion is how do you allow, how do you value and include and welcome that diversity that someone brings into the table or into the room? And then you have equality, which I love to say that if you think about equality, think about shoes, right? So if each one of us got the same pair of shoes, same size, we're going to be pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. But equity is me giving you the shoe that fits best for you so that you can have mobility, right? And then there's this other term called representation that says that inclusion isn't the goal. So we do want to include people, but we also want to make sure that everyone is represented even when they're not in the room. So can we change structures and systems that still will say, okay, this group is included even if they're not at the table? So that would be my thoughts on it. Rupal, you got anything to add? Rupal is like our go-to lexicon guru. I don't know about that. I think I've just uh, uh, marinated it in my head a lot and tried to explain it to different groups because I think you're absolutely right, both of you, in, in, in that we kind of need to be on the same page in terms of terminology and what we think of those words. And I love what both of you, you know, had to say um, about that. And I think for diversity, when we talk about it in our profession, you know, um, we know that the diversity really is uh, something that, you know, as Lisa said, you bring to a group. And when we talk about PT as a profession, whether it's students, whether it's uh, faculty, whether it's clinicians, you know, a lot of times we talk about cognitive diversity and, you know, what that is about our background, our experiences, our knowledge, how we approach problems, which is really important. Okay. But what we're lacking when we talk about diversity in physical therapy is really identity diversity, which has to do with our race, our ethnicity, our sex, our gender identity, our sexual orientation, and how that impacts, you know, the other things. And are we equitable in terms of where we are with you know, that piece of our identity in terms of um, diversity goes. So I think that's key that, you know, all all forms of diversity is important. But when we're talking about outcomes uh, and we're talking about physical therapy, we're really, you know, it's that identity diversity that's a missing piece that you see so many of us now are looking to, you know, work at. Um, so I think that would be the thing. And I think that whole piece of inclusion, a lot of times people say, well, let's not talk about diversity, let's just go straight to inclusion. And I don't think you can do that. I think that, you know, you could, you could have an inclusive group by definition can be diverse, right? But a diverse group is not always inclusive. Just because you have all different colors and races and ethnicities and gender in a group doesn't mean the group is inclusive. And I think there's a big difference there. And inclusiveness, as Lisa mentioned, is about representation. And it's really like if I'm here, here on the Zoom screen, and I've got, you know, uh, a black woman, an Asian Indian woman, you know, a white gentleman, I'm thinking both of you, but you know, so we're a diverse group, right here. But is this an inclusive environment? You know, Jimmy, you set it up to be inclusive, you know, and, and so the sense of belonging, the sense of 
I can be my authentic self and share whatever I want with you and, and these my other two colleagues who I feel very safe with, inclusive with. That's the thing, you know, and we don't always feel that way in all the environments that we're in. So there's not that inclusion. Yeah, we've heard a, a story uh, on this particular show about um, a student, a black student in PT school. And he said, well, I was included in the class. I was one of 39 students, um, but he still didn't feel included because other students had made comments out loud to him, to his face that, well, you got in because of your background. So he was not in, he was he was re he was in the room, but it, that was not an inclusive environment. How could it be? I'm sorry, Lisa, I cut you off. What were you going to say? No, I think you, that was beautiful. I have nothing else to say about that. That was great. That just well, sums it up. I think your shoe analogy, especially for PTs, right? Especially because now you get to frame it in mobility, which is, yeah, if we all got a box of shoes, great if they fit. And if we're allowed to use them and if we feel safe using those. So I think that that shoe analogy, you can go a couple different steps um, with that. Some people might say we're talking about it a little too much. Some people say we're talking about this. Oh, are we still talking about this? And I heard a great um, counter to that, which is if you think we're talking about this too much, clearly the issues didn't affect you. And, and it's very. And you are probably privileged, right? Um, privilege. And, and I will say everyone has privilege. But what I mean by that is, is that if you feel like we're talking about this too much, then you've not recognized your privilege and how you need to use it to improve the health and wellness of others. Because if you've got data that's saying that 70 to 80% of health outcomes, and I'm gonna quote Dr. Zach's work, 70 to 80% of health outcomes is related to social determinants of health. So oh. really all that pressing, clicking, thrusting that you're doing on people's joints only accounts for 20%. Zach, dropping stat bombs, talk about that. Say it again, because I, I feel like when you really when you hit them with a stat like that, you got to hit it again to make sure it sticks. Yeah. So, you know, th the reality is that at, when you look at different factors that affect health, depending on who you read, and there's some variability, right? Because these are models and no models perfect. Uh, it's a roadmap. It's not the actual terrain. Um, but when you when you look at the different models, there's a consensus that at least 40 to 50 percent of health outcomes is related to your social context and social environment. So so what we actually do uh, in terms of healthcare is pro and even access to healthcare, which is a huge issue in and of itself, is at most maybe what 20% uh, con contributor to what our health is. And wow. then we have our health behaviors, which kind of fall into a different bucket, somewhere between 30, 40%. And then the rest of it is the social environment. Are we in conditions that allow us to be healthy, right? So um, Michael Marmot, who's a, who's a professor in, in the UK, has this great quote. He says, why do we treat people and then send them back to the very conditions that made them sick in right. the first place? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I heard a great line during my first clinical rotation, which was sometimes uh, patients will walk into a clinic or a doctor's office and they'll expect to be fixed or cured or changed. Um, and one of my first CIs said, it probably took them years to get to this situation. So make sure you frame that. Hey, it's taken you years to get to this condition where you finally asked for help. You've finally shown up. Make sure you understand that that this will take change in, se in several different aspects of your life. Um, we've had conversations about food deserts, which I had never, never heard of, or food swamps. I mean, you know, Patrick Berner came on here and taught me food desert and a couple of months later taught me food swamp. And I was like, you're just making up, you're just putting food in front of different ecosystems, in front of biomes, and you're making this up. But then he talked, he explains it and saying, oh, yes, you can see this. And if you're not thinking that this has something to do with health outcomes, you're not paying attention. Yeah. Beautifully stated because sometimes as PTs and PTAs, we have to remember that we are sitting in a socioeconomic class that allows us a little more mobility than the typical American, right? And so we have to have an honest conversation about how segregated we are based yeah. on race and ethnicity, based on socioeconomic levels. When you look at our housing practices, when you look at where we educate our children. And so the resources such as nutrition, physical activity, green spaces follows the money. And so now that we've become much more segregated then what that has created is these deserts like Patrick was talking about. And we see physical activity deserts. We see rehab deserts. I think we as PTs have to own the fact of that. How many PT clinics do you see in that neighborhood with lower socioeconomics, right? And 
when are we going to call each other out about that? We might get on in the bordering community, but you're creating a transportation bar barrier for those people. Go to where the people are. If we're going to talk about transforming society, then we've got to be willing to invest and go where the people have the greatest need. That would be the equitable thing to do. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's the heart of inclusion, right? Because what Lisa's describing is that we are exclusive, you know, as a profession, as all these uh, things that we talked about. And so how do we become, you know, more inclusive in, in what we're doing in practice and everywhere else? And so I think that's, you know, definitely something that's not easy to do, but increasing our awareness of it and self-reflecting on it ourselves and then talking about this in lots of different conversations, I think is important because, you know, to people that say that, well, are we still talking about this? I think, I, you know, I've been a PT for almost 30 years and um, I can tell you that this is something that I have not heard talked about to the level that we're talking about in our profession, literally since this pandemic started. Okay. And especially since May, June, when we've had the racial injustice and all those issues percolate now because of COVID and everything else, now it's in the forefront. And I think now there's more people saying enough, whereas before people were more likely to say, yes, this is important. And yes, I don't condone this. And yes, I believe in diversity and equality and equity, but it's like, no, it's time for action. And I think we're finally seeing the needle move just slightly on that. And, and the more that we can give attention to it, like you're doing by inviting us on this podcast and having your listeners you know, view this, I think the better because some of us have been operating in these spaces, but it's not been mainstream. And I don't, I don't know if we're there yet, but I hope we're getting there, you know? And, and the issues that, you know, we're talking about in our work settings now, you know, I've been on faculty at Texas Women's for about 20 years, and it wasn't until George Floyd's murder that we actually had a faculty meeting where we just like stopped everything and talked about that. I've never done that in 20 years. And wow. this is not new issue, right? But it's it's where everyone collectively is kind of feeling like, okay, you know, we, we've got to do something we don't know what to do. And and but we need to talk about it. So I, I think we need to just keep talking about it. And the, and the folks that have had enough, they don't need to listen. But I think there's plenty of folks that, you know, probably want to listen and learn. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I I, I think that, you know, to continue on what I had brought up and you guys all commented on, which is, if you're tired of this conversation, you're probably not affected by the issue. Pause, right? Like, if, if you're tired of the conversation, you're not, you weren't deeply affected by the issue. The other side of that is, most likely, if you're, were, if you weren't affected by the issue, you're potentially th one of the biggest groups that can help to move the issue, right? This is not going to be people of color, people who are discriminated against marching in the street if the i mean i consider i'm a, I'm a 40 year old white guy right i mean i grew up in upstate new york right if people who were not negatively affected by this don't say enough this this is this isn't how our society should should operate it will not change so it isn't just are they still talking about that this is a we conversation this needs to be a we conversation or this will not go forward um, what are the things that we're doing right? I mean, I didn't, I didn't plan on asking this, but we, what are we doing right in terms of, we'll stay, well, I won't make you guys do the world or anything. That's a little too big. Our profession, what are we doing right within our profession to improve diversity, equity, inclusive? What are, what are things that make you guys say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm optimistic because this is going on. Well, I think from, I would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Ripple. No, no, no. Please. No, you go ahead. I was going to start macro and, and just talk about our APTA and strategic plan. And that this is the first time again, I've been a member since 1988 of our association. And this is the first time that we've actually had diversity, equity, inclusion as a, a big bullet in the strategic plan. And so I think uh, from a professional standpoint, and you know, that's important that that's the profession and the association's um, you know, uh, importance with that. And now kind of seeing that there's some initiatives that are being rolled out to support that, you know, that's, that's exciting for me that we haven't seen. Um, whereas before it has been kind of a small part of what has been part of our organization that has been led by some giants in our profession, like um, John at Meadows, um, who has kind of been you know, in, in APTA, the person who has grown that aspect in terms of diversity. But now we're seeing that, you know, it's 
more of the organization that's embracing that. So I'm excited about that. Welcome back to membership. It's exciting to hear that. And I, I think what, one other thing that I took away from what you guys just said was just first step to solving a problem is saying out loud that we have a problem, right? Identifying and, and admitting you have the problem. Uh, Lisa, what are we going to add to that? Optimistic. What are you looking forward? What do you, what do you, what, what brings you optimism and hope? Um, I would definitely say there appears to be an increased consciousness amongst our um, peers of lighter hue. Um, because as Rupal and as you have already stated, the problem has been there all along. So this is not a new problem. Um, and there, there is a certain amount of, um, I'm just going to say the word, supremacy in even this conversation, right? Because now that it is mainstream and the majority has decided it is an issue, we are ready to mobilize. And so I think part of, but there are people within the profession that recognize that and are willing to say our, our recognition may be delayed, but we're ready to move now. And so that is a different sentiment than where we've been at the past, because this is a conversation. If you talk to Sonora um, Simpson, she will tell you she's been having this conversation 60 years within the profession. But we definitely see a little a little more movement than what we've seen in the past. I'm going to use people of lighter hue. I'm going to steal that from you. I'm taking <laughs> that. I'm going to own that. But I think you're right. I think I, I, I didn't do I've done 700 episodes on this show. I haven't done before this year. I didn't do one on diversity, equity, equity, inclusion. Because I, I mean, for I mean, I don't even know. We're having like a therapy session here now. Like, why? Like, did I not think it was an issue? If you asked me, I'm like, yeah, but like, and but like, was it my issue? Right before 2020, I was probably like, I don't know. Someone else is. Someone else. Some talk about that. And that's the opposite of what we need to have now, right? Which is like, this is we need to we need to have this conversation, and we is a collective we. Uh, other person of lighter hue, Jack. Zach, did you want to add? <laughs> I'm killing I'm that. Yeah, I'll accept that. Uh, so I think that that for me, one of one of the things that's that's making me optimistic is um, I, I think we're going to see an increased focus uh, on on diversity, equity, inclusion. Yes, uh, within our profession, that's massively important. I think we also have to understand um, how we're taking into account patient social context as we're working with them, and are we providing them with the best care, uh, no matter who the person is that's treating them. Are we taking those social factors into account? I think we're going to see some more emphasis specifically on on social determinants of health as we move forward as well. And that's that's optimistic for me because I think that's, as I mentioned, just a massive piece of the equation of what's going to improve our community's health that we've just completely ignored up until now. So Rupal mentioned, mentioned it earlier, macro to micro. So we're, we're talking about social determinants of health, how they impact. We threw some stats in there. We got a little bit more macro in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. How about we go tactical micro? Let's talk about tools to integrate social determinants of health, how to bring this into someone's PT practice. Someone listens or watches this episode right now. What can they be doing tactically tomorrow, this week, this month, to move the needle either in their one-to-one -one interaction with a patient or their practice or their giant you know, franchise practice? What can we be doing? What are the tools to integrate this into being? Because that's the only way change happens, right? Yeah, there's. Uh, I think that's the toughest part. And it's interesting because I am teaching my health promotion class right now. And so just last week, I had this conversation with my students about, you know, integrating social determinants and knowing what they are. And, and the biggest barrier that they brought up, I had them kind of write a blog about it, is to their own self-efficacy and self-confidence with addressing sensitive issues. And if they bring how to bring it up and then what to do if the patient uh, has that as an issue. And so not knowing what to do, not knowing how to bring it up really stops people from having to, you know, dive into this conversation. And so I think there are tools that are available. I know that uh, my colleagues know my favorite tool is by Health Leads, and uh, that has 10 questions that really are psychometrically really good and areas where you can ask questions of your patients. I think the hard part is the art of how to do it, you know, how to ask the question in a sensitive manner so that you, uh, you are respecting the person and you are entering their space and inviting them to enter your space and acknowledging that you may not have all the answers, but you're willing to kind of explore this aspect of their life because that is the most important aspect to them. 
and not necessarily the shoulder pain or the back pain or whatever it is that they're coming to you for. And I think that is a big crucial part of it is us getting comfortable in doing that. And I think it does start with educating students. And I would love to see something like social determinants of health and how to screen for that as a first semester or first year item and not necessarily something you think about after you teach them everything else, then make this the cherry on top because we need to go upstream. We need to look at the structure determinants, this, you know, the, the community determinants so that we can make an impact at the individual level. What did you say was your, was your, was your go-to? What was that one more time? Health leads. I can drop it in our chat. Yeah. And, and, and so what is that? Is that like an outcome? Is that like a, like a 10 question? Like, what is that? Yeah, it's a, it's a health leads is an organization that has uh, developed, um, you know, a screening tool and it's very quick and easy 10 questions um, written at a very good health literacy level that we can incorporate in all our settings, you know, with patients. And I know my colleagues have other tools, but that's just my go-to one that I use. All right. Yeah. So we'll drop in the comments below. Lisa, what do you got? So I would say even before that patient interaction, um, think about how you have prepared and trained um, to be able to do that physical therapy evaluation. You need to do the same work in regards to the evaluation of the communities that you serve, because you can ask most business owners, most managers, what's your payer mix? And they can tell you what their payer mix is. Well, can you also tell me what the social mix is for your um, facility in regards to what are the social issues? Who are the people that you serve and what are their barriers? And there are public sources to give you that information. So we've got our American health rankings. We've got the county health rankings. There's what's known as the social vulnerability index. So there's a ton of tools out there where you can know what the barriers are for the communities that you serve. And in some situations, even down to the zip code. Wow. So if you were to do that training and preparation in advance, like you did for MMT and mobilization and joint assessment, that conversation is not going to be quite as uncomfortable. Would you ever start treating um, a portion of the body you haven't really, really looked into, I mean, what's the, one of the first classes we learned, right? Anatomy and physiology. Do you not know the anatomy and physiology, which is now demographics and psychographics of the area you're going to be treating in? How can you expect to know? If you went to a foreign country, what would you study first? What are your customs? How do you operate? Who's here? Who's here? So assuming, I feel like assuming is something we probably do a lot, and that can get us into trouble. You start grouping everybody together and assuming everybody's the same. If I treated everybody how I just assume I grew up, I will be missing a large portion of the patient population in my area. You're, exactly, you're exactly right, Jim. Because when you assume, you you have to default to your stereotypes and implicit sure. bias. Because yeah. that's the quickest thing that you have in your toolbox. Yeah. Zach, what do you got? Tools, integrating social determinants health. What do we want to add? Yeah, so, so I wanted to touch on something you said there, Jimmy. You know, I mentioned this in our ELC talk this past weekend. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe as, as PT educators, we need to be okay with being good enough at range of motion, at manual muscle testing, at some of the things that we think are extremely important, but which at the end of the day, we just need to be good enough at. We don't need to be perfect at them. We need to be good enough at them. Because what we really need to be good at is what we're talking about here. We need to be good at communicating with patients. We need to be good at, about understanding the communities at which individuals are embedded in and how community forces inter interact and influence individuals' decision making um, so that we can pull not just levers at individual levels, what's your home program, but we can pull levers at that community level too and say, what does the community need to be healthy? And how can I work on that as well? How can I go to my city council? How can I get involved in my health system? Um, how can I move further up in the socio-ecological model, right? Move beyond individuals into, into thinking about neighborhoods as a unit of transformation. Um, how do we get to that point? How do we bake that into our education? How do we bake that into our practice? So that's the norm of what we're doing and not the exception. I think those are the questions we need to be grappling with if we're going to remain relevant and really meet our vision statement moving forward. And it was very conscious, right? I mean, the APT, I mean, whenever you put together a vision statement, like, believe me, there's a lot of meetings. I don't want to go to those meetings because they're long. But I love the fact that other people like to go to those meetings, right? But when you say transform society by dot, 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 
okay, you've identified your who, right? And it's where my communications background comes in. Okay, I know my audience. Society. Oh, man, that's a lot of well, actually all of us. Okay, great. And from communications, the first thing I would do is who? Well, we need to find who your who is. Like, what's your avatar? How do you do that? Well, there really is no one avatar. There can't be. And can you aim at the average? Well, that would be Jimmy, right? 40-year-old white dude. You know? Okay, great. So you just aim at Jimmy. You miss a lot on both sides of that bell curve. So understanding who your who is um, matters to, depends on where you are. And you need to be open to understanding who that is. Um, rehab outcomes was something you guys got into as well. Well, we before we get there, Jimmy, I, I do want to add one piece um, to this whole uh, social determinants and screening. I think the, you know, if you get comfortable asking the questions, that's great. We all need to do that in every setting from, you know, neonate to end of life um, in every setting, every kind of patients we work with. But asking the questions is not enough. OK, and before you go to ask the questions you have to have a plan in place. Just like we do with our plan of cares when we do an examination and we measure range of motion, if the range of motion is gonna be limited, we have a plan. We have a set of exercises and mobilizations and manipulations we can do to fix that. So that's the thing. When you ask about social determinants of health, you have to have the plan to not necessarily fix it for the patient, but at least um, hook them up with resources where they can get help to do that. And so that's where I'm going to punt it to Zachary because I want him to mention a couple of the sites that we have mentioned in our talk um, at CSM and others that I know people have found to be really useful before we get into outcomes. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely. I think that that one of the, the main ways that we can find out, you know, and build our Rolodex of community partners and, and stakeholders, right? Because this is a team sport when we start thinking outside of our clinic boxes. It's a team sport to help patients. Um, so who are going to be our partners? Who are going to be the stakeholders that, that we're going to be leaning on and, and linking with? Um, and so uh, the, uh, uh, the AAFP, the American Academy of, uh, of Family Physicians, has a great navigator tool um, that I can put in the, uh, a link to in the show notes um, that, that helps you by your, your area, your local area, figure out who are these community partners that I can contact if a patient comes to me with food insecurity. If a patient comes to me with housing insecurity, if a patient comes to me with social needs, right? That's at the individual level at social needs, um, that we can hook them up with those social needs and, and community partners to do that. So um, there's another website that I believe is uh, out of base and was and was started out of your neck of the woods, Rupal, down in Texas. Um, Aunt is, uh, yeah, Aunt Bertha is another great one. They have resources all over the country as well. It's not just local to Texas. But those are two websites I would steer clinicians to specifically um, to begin to better understand what are the resources in your neighborhood that you can be talking with folks about. And just so everybody's uh, aware, either watching or listening, when we release the podcast episode, we'll take a lot of these resources, we'll put the link in the show notes. So we're gonna build, we're gonna build your notes for you. No need to be like, you know, jotting stuff down. We've got you. Um, so do you want to talk about outcomes now? I don't want to rush. Yeah, I just knew we had that piece that, yeah, no, I don't, I don't miss anything. you know, and you know what, people get tired of people asking them, especially healthcare providers, um, keep asking them about housing insecurity, about can you pay your bills? Do you live in a clean, uh, you know, area? Do you have parks and recs in your neighborhood? And then like their answer is no, no, no. And then like, oh, okay, well, thank you for telling me that. Right. What are you going to do? Now? Help that is, and in fact, you know, there was a, a editorial I think we mentioned in our talk from the New England Journal of Medicine where it said that it's actually not it's it's an unethical thing to do to just ask about these things and not have a plan. Of and course. so, do, do your due diligence and get out there, look at those sites that Zachary just mentioned, and also just network with your community, community organizations and other partners and, and have some resources handy so that when the patient does say that that's an issue, you can hook them up with you know resources in their community. This goes back to what I learned in PT school and not to uh, Professor Jason Craig. He had an Irish accent, so it sounded smarter. He would just always say, what? So what? Now what? So what are you asking? So what? But now what are you going to do about it? So what? So what? Now what? Are you are you going to be caught flat-footed? Never be caught flat-footed. What, what are you going to be doing that? There's a, a great increased conversation on mental health. You you now understand your patient has a mental health issue. Do you, do you not have a resource? Or, or, and it's okay if you don't. Like, I'm not 
trying to make it work. But you need to make sure you can go find that resource. I will. I am willing to do the legwork because I asked this question. I now need to be to make sure I can re refer or offer you a solution, a potential solution. Yep. Yep. Because Jimmy, you're exactly right. Right. Because one of the things, one of our core values is evidence based practice or evidence informed practice. And so the evidence is telling us already that 70 to 80 percent of health outcomes are going to be based on social factors. And so and I group those health behaviors into social issues because the data suggests that you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And because we segregate into communities and communities tend to be homogenous, we have to address those social factors as PTs. You can have the best PT plan of care, but just like y'all said, if you're going to not help to improve the health and wellness of that community, it's just going to be short term. Right. And that's how we're, we're trying to cha transform society. Transform to me doesn't sound like a short term fix, right? I, I don't transform myself from day to day. You transform yourself long term. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move to uh, to rehab outcomes. We heard some statistics from from uh, from Zach's work. What are some other rehab outcomes that you guys would want to bring up? My goodness, where do we start? <laughs> I mean, I think that in everything that we look at, you know, if we look at the repeat offenders in our practice settings and. I'll just pick on musculoskeletal health and outpatient practice settings where, you know, you have patients that come to you and for an episode of care, you take care of their problem, their, you know, functional limitation, their, you know, uh, whatever's going on with them, uh, impairments, and then you send them their way and, and give them a nice home program and, and you pat yourself on the back, job well done, check, 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 goals met. And then here it comes three months, six months, a year later, they're back for the same thing. And then what do we do? We make it their problem, right? Mm -hmm. And we say, oh, if they had followed my home program, or if they had just done this, then they could have gotten better. Um, and, and so, you know, the outcomes are poor because a lot of the musculoskeletal medicine patients with chronic conditions are repeat uh, in terms of what we do. So it's really our outcomes, right? It's what we're doing is not working. And you know, one of the things we teach ourselves, we teach our students is, if you're doing something that's not working, don't do it again, yeah. like, do something different. And so this is where we have to look upstream. So I, I challenge every therapist, every student, every educator out there that, you know, teach yourselves and your students to say, okay, you know, if it doesn't work the first time, the next time that patient comes in, you need to figure out what is it that you're doing that it has not addressed the issue? And, and if you haven't already looked upstream from the beginning, and if you're not an upstreamist from the beginning, then that second time they come, you need to become an upstreamist and, and look upstream at some of the other factors, pull out the social needs assessment and the screening tool, talk to them about that as part of their subjective, give them the resource Aunt Bertha and the AAFP uh, and and really talk about that and 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 spend time doing that and then afterwards say, okay, now how are we going to address what else can I do to help improve this? So that to me is all about outcomes. And I didn't give any stats there, but you know, that's my challenge. Yeah. And I'm gonna also add in that sometimes the therapist could be part of that social determinants of health, right? Because that therapeutic alliance is a social relationship. It's an oh. intercultural exchange. And so if you're noticing that you have a client that is in that revolving door, could it possibly be something with you? Because the data suggests that for certain racial and ethnic groups in PT, we are impacting their outcomes by either not offering them certain services or offering services at a lower frequency. So sometimes you have to do a self-assessment of how might I be contributing um, to this patient's progress based on my implicit and explicit bias. Wow. I had not thought about that. Zach, you want to add anything here? Yeah, I can add a couple of things. Uh, so, you know, Lisa, absolutely. I think that is spot on. Um, if we're not considering that we are part of the equation, and 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 we have some responsibility here as well. I, I think we're we're doing a massive disservice to society, right? You know, I go back to we're licensed by our states. 
whether you're a PT or a PTA, you have a license. That's a privilege from the state. And in return for the privilege, we have responsibilities. We have, re we have responsibilities to the public. That is what we are licensed to do. So are we meeting those responsibilities in the way that we're providing our care? Are we intentionally meeting those responsibilities? Because if we're not being intentional, we're likely not meeting them. Um, so I think you, we have to be thinking this way. Uh, and Lisa, I think just absolutely what you said, spot on. Um, mm -hmm. I can add a few statistics here, actually. So I'm, that's been a bit of the work I've been doing in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we looked at what happens after folks get lumbar surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. And this paper is under review right now. Um, and, and when you control for all of the factors you can basically control for, what kind of surgery they had, how involved it was, what other health conditions they had going on, um, when you control for age, when you control for all kinds of things, um, just when you look at these social factors as, as, as the predictors, you know, if you have 100 people, if 80 or 90 people are going to have a great outcome, they're going to meet their MCID for leg pain, back pain, ODI, all that good stuff after a, a back surgery. Um, it's going to be 20 people fewer just based on, on not even on the downstream health behaviors, just based on those underlying structural factors. Um, and we see, you know, how racism is manifested in our country. We see how segregation impacts people. These structural factors, when you account for those, it's 20 people fewer are going to have successful outcomes across satisfaction, quality wow. of life, back pain, leg pain, and, and disability. That's not nothing. And if we are not understanding that, if we are not taking that into account, if we're not looking outside of our clinics even, it's great to do social needs screening. That's not enough. That's a first step, right? Mm -hmm. We have to go out and into the communities and mm -hmm. do something out there. That's where the people are living. We need to beach them out there. Um, you know, What are our business models like to enable us to do this? Um, do we have business models that enable us to do this? If not, why not? Why are we why are we stuck in a model where where we're all we're doing is running in the hamster wheel? Um, you know, ah, so you know we see. I think for me, I'll say personally, I'll, I'll share one anecdote, and then I'm going to shut up for a moment. Um, you know, I when I was a clinician in, in my first job, I, you know, the the fact that people would come back to me, I took actually as a real sign of respect that these people trusted me with their mm -hmm. health, that I that I had somehow built a rapport with them. Uh, you know, the, it was sort of a family atmosphere. It was something I was really proud of. And I worked very hard to cultivate. And yet the longer I've been in it, the more I've realized maybe that's a poison chalice, right? Maybe it tastes so sweet. And yet there's actually some poison in there because the fact that they are coming back to me again and again means that there's still things going on out there in the community, in their lives that I've not been addressing, that I've not been impacting, that maybe haven't affected me personally. And so I'm not, I'm not there to, to really put my skin in that game. So seeing that switch was really the thing for me that helped me understand as a professional, I have a responsibility here that I cannot abdicate. Jimmy, like you need one of those mic drop uh, things and fire yeah. things. Oh, because exactly what Zachary just gave it. NBA, yeah. Jim, Jim Shakalaka. I like the fact that we started talking about, you know, voting situations, which is very, very current events. And Zach brought up rights and responsibilities, right? I feel like a big conversation, especially in this country, is these are my rights. I have rights. Our country is built on rights. Um, if you demand your rights without recognizing your responsibilities, that's an adolescent behavior, right? I want, I demand, I need, it's mine, it's my right. Well, your responsibility in society, in your household, in your community, whatever, wherever you're going to be, whatever pond you're going to be lumped into, you do have rights. We will not take those rights away from you. You also have responsibilities. And if you're not living up to that, then you are living counter to our how society works. You are now making our society worse. And I will leave it at that. Um, anything else we didn't cover? I always like to ask this. I never want to move on before I make sure that is there anything we you guys didn't get out there that you wanted to on this topic? And you can always come back. But I mean, I want to make sure before we leave today that you guys got everything. Well, I would say that the, you know, the rehab outcomes piece um, and Zachary's done some work on it. I think I, I was trying to think of the paper by Dr. Fritz that just came out, uh, you know, where they looked at that and looking upstream as well. But I think this is where we're lacking in our research and, and doing more research on 
you know, this aspect of how things impact. We have lots of data in medicine from medical research, from nursing research, from other disciplines, right? In terms of how, uh, you know, health outcomes are impacted by this. And um, so we need more of that. And, you know, we need more emphasis in our research streams and our research lines in our funding for research. And, uh, you know, where there's more funding lines available for rehab practitioners, specifically physical therapists, to actually look at this, you know, so that we can, you know, we can show that, hey, yes, this is the evidence, which, you know, we're pretty sure from practice standpoint and what we see in medicine, because when you think about health outcomes, when you think about cancer outcomes, Lisa, you can go on and on on that subject, he you know, heart disease outcomes. We know that, you know, when we don't address the social determinants, when we don't address ra the racial and income inequality, that outcomes are extremely poor. I remember Lisa, uh, you sharing a stat in our California presentation of maternal mortality and stuff. And I remember looking at that slide and just being blown away. Like I, I know that, but seeing the numbers, it just like, wow, you know, we have a lot of work to do. So I think research and funding for research for people that are interested in addressing this, it's messy work, it's uncomfortable work. It's not a highly controlled variable that you can just you know, control in a lab, it's being where the people are, it's doing the research in the communities where people work, live, live you know, pray and play type thing. And we need more of that. Rupal says- I it, love uh, that. The messy work and in Lisa's Twitter profile, it says she likes asking messy questions. If you don't ask the messy questions- I do. You don't, yeah. and, and I think, you know, we have to honor the fact that that person came to us in a place where they were they were uncomfortable. So people come to therapy for a reason right now because of our tertiary care model. And so you need to match that and get just as uncomfortable in regards to asking the questions, building the relationships, stretching yourself. Um, because I tell people all the time, if you are taking care of African-American women and you are not asking about their perceived and actual racist events, then you have no idea of what's going on with their health because the data suggests that that may be one of their greatest predictors. Before you start talking with them about how overweight they are or obese, you really need to ask them about their lived journey. And the only other thing I'm going to add is just the fact of that, you know, just be curious. That's the only thing I ask of PTs is have the beginner eye. Just don't assume that you know who somebody is based on how they present to you. Yeah, don't assume. All right, you guys ready to play three questions? Let's we're do doing it. We're doing it, right? I don't know why I asked, but I always ask, but we're doing it whether you're ready or not. Three questions from our friends at Arius Medical Staffing, uh, leaders in travel physical therapy. You decide. Zach mentioned you have a license, right, from the state. Well, nothing says you got to stay in that state. Let's your license, your PT license, which is national, by the way. But then you got to pay for a state license. You got to transfer. The, I, we're not going to get into that. Um, but let your license take you where you want to go. Let your, let your education take you where you want to go. A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. That is the website to find out what they have to offer. Uh, positions in all 50 states in Washington, D.C. In all settings, too, not just outpatient ortho. Uh, so we'll go around the horn. We'll go Lisa, Rupal, Zach. First question is a where question. Lisa, you are in Louisiana, but if you could go anywhere you wanted, once it's safe, let's take that out of the equation. This is hypothetical. Once it's safe, where would you want to go? Nassau. I miss my best friend, Katie. Nassau, not a bad answer. Rupal, where are you going? You're in Texas now. Where would you want to go? Antarctica. Antarctica. A lot of PT going. Well, I don't, actually, I don't know. A lot of we were supposed to go this uh, December for our 25th wedding anniversary. And Antarctica? Cancel it. Antarctica, an Antarctic expedition. You got to be honest, going from Nassau to Antarctica, that might be the two, the biggest change in terms of uh, climate. Zach, where are we going? You know what? I just want a weekend away from my very small children. <laughs> uh, it could be it could be 30 minutes away. It could be an hour away. It doesn't matter. I just want 30. I just want a weekend away from my small children. Yeah, I exactly. love them. This, exactly. this is going to be on the Internet forever. So I just want, want to put that out there. I love my children. Just need a break sometimes. Got it. Second question on three questions is the what question. Uh, so we'll start with Lisa. What's something you've watched, read, or listened to? A book, a, a movie, a documentary, a podcast, anything. Something that you think the audience could get value from. Oh, there's a book called The Best Yes. And the author, she spells her name Lisa, L-Y-S-A. 
and it's T E R K E U R S T. The best, yes. Perfect, Rupa. What do you got? What's your what? Oh my gosh, uh, you know I'm a TED junkie, TED TED Talk junkie, and uh, uh, the the TED Talk by um, Rishi Manchenda that Juliet's talking about in our private chat is excellent. When we talk about like looking upstream and social needs and why we need to do this, it's 15 minutes, well worth your time. Yeah. It's a pretty good investment in time in terms of a TED Talk. They're, they can't be longer than 17 minutes. So go go listen to a, a TED Talk, TED Radio Hour. Uh, Zach, what do you got? Yeah, I think uh, I mentioned Michael Marmot earlier, and, and he's really a pioneer in understanding how social factors influence different aspects of health. He wrote a book called The Health Gap. Um, and I would strongly recommend that if you're interested in understanding um, how structural and social factors impact health and what 50 years of data tells us and where we can go from here. Perfect. All right. Last question is all about uh, who we like to start and end with people. So who I leave it open ended on purpose. Who is someone the audience should know more about? <laughs> Your chance to give a shout out to someone who maybe who's flying, doing great work, but flying under the radar. I like how Lisa immediately was like, oh, I, that that look for my years of interviewing means she has like 50 and she's trying to narrow it down without leaving people out. But also I for, tell them I forced you to, to narrow it down. So I am going to give a shout out to whom I think is a silent giant. Okay. Um, so Rebecca Griffith, she is doing amazing work um, out there in California, out there in Colorado. My apologies. And if you ever wanted a master class in how to be an ally and an accomplice, she is your person. She is your person. What you, the two words you just said, ally and accomplice, is something we probably could do an entire episode about. Yeah. And, how, and the how-to guide. All right, Rupal, who's your who? Oh, my goodness. Wow. I'm, I'm with Lisa. Even after having all that time, I'm just like... Who do I mention? Who do I say? You know, and uh, I guess I'll go outside of our profession. And I would say that, you know, something that's really influenced me the last few months has been um, Professor Kendi's work. Um, he's now with Boston University, where my daughter is headed in the spring. But um, he, his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, I think, has been very influential in making me think about this whole aspects of, um, you know, I always thought I was not racist, and but I have not been anti-racist since I'm learning to be anti-racist. And that's going to be important in my work in social determinants and all that stuff. And I think the other book, uh, uh, White Fragility by uh, Robin DiAngelo, um, has been another one that I've been reading because um, even though I'm not white or Caucasian, I certainly have some of the privileges, as Lisa had mentioned before. So I would go with those two, Professor Kendi and Robin DiAngelo. Two, not one. <laughs> it's all right. We won't charge you extra. Uh, Zach, what do you got for us? Who's your who? That is a, that, that's a really good question. I think I'll, I'll follow along in, in Rupal's uh, theme, and I'll say Tema Okun. Um, who, uh, I don't know if you both are familiar with her. I've had the privilege of, of um, being mentored by her in some of the faculty development things we've done here at Duke. Um, her, her website, Dismantling Racism, uh, is just phenomenal. And if you ever get the chance to sit with her, um, she's just so full of wisdom and, and it, has been so immersed in this and walked uh, walked the walk for a long time. I think she's somebody I would I would raise up. Love that. And Rebecca is watching this live, so it's got to be pretty pretty cool, Lisa. She's watching, you know, making dinner with the kids in Colorado, and she's saying she's probably crying. <laughs> That's Rebecca is one of those very wonderfully emotional, you know, people that I love too. So <laughs> love it. All right, last thing we do on the show. This this is what you were talking about a second ago, Rubel. This this is really your mic drop. So we call this the parting shot. Parting Sean is brought to you by our friends at the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. The leaders in uh, orthopedic PT. It's in my name, guys. It's a trick question. Uh, they've got some great courses out there. People, A lot of people are using the time where they can't travel to, I don't know, Antarctica right now to maybe level up their game. <laughs> I would love to go. I just, how do, how do you get there? We'll talk about that later. But, uh, uh, current concepts of orthopedic physical therapy, that's their like prep course if you're going to take the OCS, which I think the deadline to submit for board certification is coming up pretty soon. So find them online at orthopt.org. So parting shot, your last chance for a mic drop moment. It could be a quote, a sentiment, whatever, but just what would you want to leave the audience with as we uh, wrap up? Lisa, what do you got? 
Okay, so I'm going to go with the Martin Luther King quote, right? Because I find that that is often the go-to when people want to silence you. They're like, why can't you just be a good person? You can, I'm a, you can fill in the blank however you want. But what he said is, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate who constantly says, I agree with you and the goals you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. So realize that sometimes people are taking the action because they need to be seen and heard. This goes along with what we were talking about earlier. If you're asking the question about determinants, but without a plan, then you obviously don't care about the outcome. Why are you asking without a plan? Where are you looking downstream? Uh, well said. Rupo, parting shot. What do you got for? All right. So I think that, you know, I'll, I'll go with something. This is from an article that was written a while ago, but it's our environments cultivate our communities and our communities nurture our health. So when you have inequities that are high and community assets that are low, then health outcomes are at their worst. So what we need to do is, you know, create uh, communities where inequities are low and assets are high because that's really what health outcomes are all about. Can't transform society without that. All right, Zach, parting shot. What do you got for us? I got three what ifs. Okay. So the first one, what if we continue to embrace the patient client relationship and started seeing our communities as our patients as well? First one I've got, what if we framed our practice, not just as one to one, but one to many. And finally, what if we recognize that your zip code may be more important than your genetic code and your social environment is going to trump any treatment that we offer in the clinic? I think if we recognize those three things, we truly have an opportunity to live up to what our profession can be. Yeah, well said by all of you guys. I, I wanted to throw this in. We can be social determinants of changing health, right? That's our profession. We can, we can determine that these things change if we pay attention and recognize where we fit, where the different, where the different questions we need to ask and the different plans we need to make. Uh, come into play. So I want to thank you guys for dropping by the show. A lot of people uh, chiming in as they watch and uh, and listen live on the socials. Uh, would love to have you guys back on the show and uh, and talk more, but appreciate your time for coming out and talking to us today. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Jimmy.